Yeah. One of the big problems that I found in this tree, when you get into more of a more of a not standard thing, but more configurable, like a bigger system, mm -hmm. uh, got pumps and everything else on it, even big systems. Um, this leaves a lot. Uh, they don't ask you the question like the old Metasys one, the old Metasys. HTC Pro. Pro. Yeah. You could have the biggest program and throw it in the AHU and it would work by default. Right, right. It may not work right, but it would work. No matter what you did, okay. it would work. All right. You can't do it. that with this. You get into some of these programs and it'll just sit there and look at you like, okay guys, you've got to put like on the pumps. You have to input capacitors if you have two pumps or more. You have to input the you have to input information into it, or it'll sit there with a question mark and go, I don't know what to do. That's what I'm talking about. It needs to be in the tree so that the system will run or ask you. Well, I, I think um, I think there's two things to that. One is this is a very engineering intensive tool once you break it down. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not like you just when you use the question and answer tree, that's very simple, right? Radio button, radio button, radio button, radio. But if you're gonna break that thing down. You have to know what's going on, right? It's not the simplest tool in the world. And the second thing is that once you get an application that's done, you can actually simulate this application right in your computer. You don't have to download it to a controller. So you can simulate it and do those inputs, right? right. I'm gonna give it space temperature, I'm gonna give it, you know, air uh, you know an air temperature, whatever I'm doing, right? I can modulate something open and close and see how the thing reacts, right? So the more familiar you are with the standard applications and how they function, the more you're familiar with the standard blocks, like what does the free cooling block do? What does the PID block do, right? Especially in the PID block, you have things like PRAC and P Adaptive. Those are um, your algorithms that have been uh, patented by our company to get you to set point faster, you know? And sometimes you're sitting there going like, why isn't this output ramping up faster? That's because it was on a week ago and not doing anything, didn't have any air, didn't have any water, right? And the PRAC was winding it up so it's going, you know, Where's my heat? Where's my heat? Where's my heat? Right? It'll take a while to unwind, right? So maybe things like disabling crack or you know just starting it up, starting it over again, and, and doing that are, are helpful tips, right? And those are things you learn along the way, you know. And all I do with the guy that does this tool is make it easier, make it easier, make it easier. Because right now, today, it's it's a tough tool, right? You can do anything you want, and that's great. But then again, you can do anything you want, which makes it very difficult, right? So I would say if you're going to do anything, spend most of your time on learning what. CCT does. You know, if you know your applications, what's in them, then you can know, then you'd be confident in your outputs, right? You'd be confident that the application that I put in here is going to work and work every time. Um, it also has a size of wizard, so it's based on like uh, HVAC Pro, as David mentioned. I don't know if you guys are familiar with HVAC Pro. HVAC Pro is an application that we use to program our legacy type controllers. So it's the same kind of question and answer. And they added things like side loops that people wanted. So like an AI to AO side loop. Let's go ahead, I go through the question and answer to do a VAV box, but I want to do something else like turn on a fan. Hey, when I'm occupied, turn on a fan. <coughs> you can do a, you know, a binary input to binary output side loop. It makes it very easy to do that kind of thing. So you keep all your logic, you have to like, know the logic, you just add that actual side loop to it. Um, what's common to all these devices? The FC bus, that's our MSTP bus, field controller bus, that's what we call it. Right? So it's used for peer to peer and also to a supervisory tech device. It's BACnet, uh, MSTP, so ASHRAE standard protocol. And they're all BTL uh, tested, so BASC for these guys, uh, BBC for these guys. Um, the advanced controllers, the PCA, they're B advanced controllers. So we're BACnet from the top to bottom, all this stuff. We've got flexible inputs and outputs. Once upon a time, we were great at going, guess what? This controller has five analog inputs, four binary inputs, three analog outputs, four binary outputs. Now I've got two more configurable ones. So the outputs, if you look at them, output like this, are like this. So you can make it an analog output or a binary output. You can make it an analog input or a binary input, right? They're configurable, right? So you do that to all of them. And then each one of the devices has an SA bus. So I can add devices to it, like sensors, expansion modules, displays, that sort of thing. Do these controllers look familiar at all? Do you guys see these out in the field as maybe gray type controllers? They're the, they're the same color, but I mean the same oh, functionality. Yeah, great, right? So the same controllers, the John's controllable branch cells, right? They're the same input output capabilities, 
the tool that you use to program them is the same. The only difference being is that we have white controllers on Facility Explorer, and we talk to them with PCT on the branch side. They have gray controllers, and they talk to them with CCT. So I can't go to a gray controller and use PCT to talk to it. I have to use, or CCT. I have to use CCT to talk to the gray controllers. I have to use PCT to talk to the white controllers. But everything's all the same. We consolidated it all so that we could unify our like, tech support, right? Tech support questions come in. Instead of having to satisfy two or three different hardware platforms, now we only have one, right? Tools, right? FX Builder, HVAC Pro, you know, that sort of thing. Right now we have one tool, PCT, so the questions all come in. You can go to that unified database and be able to answer questions faster. Okay, so basically you have to sell the same thing as we offer to the Johnson Control branch. Okay. Everyone of these devices have an SA sensor actuator bus, and so that's for adding the additional inputs and outputs to the controllers, right? So the SA bus, you can put things like expansion modules, you can put them on a PCG controller, PCA, PCV, you can expand a, a VAV controller. I put normally room sensors on there, so that's just a connection that can either be, you know, phone jack connected, like this, where you plug in an RJ12 connection, or you can do, uh, I think I have one here with like a terminal connection on it as well. Yeah, terminal block connection on here as well. So you can wire it, you know, with, uh, with wires as well. So either or. That's the tool interface. I can plug this guy into the sensor at the bottom and be able to launch my PCT tool for commissioning, downloading, uploading, whatever I want to do. I can also plug this guy into the face of the controller to be able to communicate with the controller, right? So I can plug it directly into that. Or if I have an FX supervisory type device, I can use that supervisory device as a backnet router. So I can be anywhere on the planet. As long as I can ping the supervisory device with an IP address, I can go and upload, download to that MSTP bus remotely. Okay, so you can be sitting in your office, but let's say you go someplace and you download an application, they say, oh, guess what, I want humidity too. The whole thing is two and a half hours away. As long as you get to that IP address, I can upload that application, change it, re-download it if I want to. The key is that you have that internet connectivity to this supervisory device. Did they fix the problem with the download PCXs from through the PCGs with firmware and uh, firmware. They're, they're working on that. Okay. They're working so on it that. hasn't been fixed yet. 10.1 will not ex exactly have that. What he's referring to is. That's an example of why you want to be there. Yeah, right, exactly. That's an example of why I want to be there. And that's this. Let's say today I go and download a controller. I have a PCG controller and it has a PCX on there for extra inputs and outputs. And let's say a new firmware route comes out. And I want to take advantage of that firmware because it's got something in it that's really cool, you know, a new object or new something, right? I want to download it. When you download today, you have to download the PCX itself as the expansion module. With 10.2, 10.1 is coming out in December for launch and January for shipping. Um, 10.2, shortly thereafter, maybe four months after that, I can download a controller and automatically download the PCX controller with the new firmware. Right, yeah, so that's coming up in the future, right? Today, if I have this on here, like this, I'd have to download, in order to make this guy work, I have to plug into that guy and, down, and download it directly. Right, so they're fixing that problem. So, but I don't know how often you go out there and change the firmware and everything like that in the controller, but you might have to. something that we experienced in the field. Um, on the outputs, you use the triac outputs. You have to have a certain amount of bias to keep those pulled in. The little yellow rib, or excuse me, little yellow object relays, the, the coolant that's not, it doesn't draw very much uh, power, okay? And what was happening is we did with bouncing, because the triac wouldn't stay locked in. Uh, if you use the rib relays, it solves that problem. So, uh, you know, if you use the triac outputs, and also if you've got any of the kind of like, uh, uh, Rooftops sometimes have got like a gas <coughs> controller on them for the igniter and all that stuff. Uh, sometimes you might get a floating ground. So it's always better to isolate those triacs with a relay or something to keep that from feeding back because that'll also mess you up sometimes when using the uh, outputs. <coughs> or if you use our blue CSD relays, they work better. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing you know, on the, if you look at any truck stock, Randy, these guys have got the yellow oh, I deck all over the place. Well, Just be cautious with those. Just be cautious with those. I know. Okay. 
Also on the SA bus, you can put things like duct sensors, right? So I can either take a duct sensor, make it communicate on the SA bus, or I can put a you know a thousand ohm sensor on there, either or. But uh, that that allows you to add that temperature value without using up one of the I solid controller. You can also put things like our variable speed drives on there. So I don't know if you guys sell drives through this outlet, but you can bring these guys in and command them with the uh, with the uh, PCG or PCB or PCA controllers. The display is also on there. And you can also put out a wireless sensor box. So that's an option for you. <coughs> and I like it because it's just a device that looks like this. Right? It's a WRZ7860. I put that on the SA bus, and I can have up to five, this shows four, but I can have up to five wireless sensors like this communicating to the device. So I can get a temperature value, a humidity value, temperature and humidity, occupancy, right? I can do that. We also have things like this, like a refrigerator freezer sensor, right? So let's see a school, and they want to know what the, what the refrigerators are doing. You got a hospital, and they got those coolers everywhere that are rolling around that have uh, you know medicine in it or blood or whatever they have in there. You put this on the outside of it, put this across the seal of it. This is a small gauge wire; you can still close the box, and then put this on the inside of it so you get the temperature of those things. And they'll communicate, so you don't no longer have to have like a clipboard on the side of the refrigerator where it comes every half an hour and goes, "Oh, guess what? The temperature is you know 27 degrees." Yes, I write, I write that down, right? So I can hand these guys. So this, these guys are all put. You know, daisy chain wired in, right? But then I can have a wireless sensor box. Did they ever come out with an antenna with a, with a router repeater that is sealing mount? Not yet. That's what I want them to do. Today, this, oh, here's my flag, right? Yeah. You plug this guy into the device that makes it a wireless device. I want to get something like a, you know, looks like a smoke detector or whatever else. So I can put it, you know, like this. You can take it out of this plastic, you know, whichever way you want. To. Oh yeah, sure. Oh, I didn't the plastic know that. is just a cover. We've done it tons of times. Oh. Places like um, schools, right? Yeah. You know, univentilators. You can't put the flag. And I'll talk about this, but you can't put the flag inside the univentilator box because no. it attenuates the signal. So what they've done is taken this thing off, put this in there, run wire mold up the wall, and put this in like a plastic J uh, electrical box. Works just fine, right? And we'll talk about wireless stuff. I think you take that out. Oh, sure. Yeah, you can do it. So what I want to do is take this thing and put it into an assembly that looks like a, you know, like a smoke detector or something like that. So it hangs below the ceiling level. If people get above the ceiling, they break them right off. Well, not only that, it's like you never know what's above the ceiling. We have tools that we are able to test that. Yeah. And you're supposed to use them to go, all right, guess what? One flag is over there. My other flag is going to be here. You press the button. Three blanks, I'm good. They never test it, right? Everybody goes, oh, yes, I tested it, I tested it, I tested it. And they go and hang it up there, and then they don't do it. So, it's a, But it's a really good option. It's a very hardy, wireless. It works very well, and uh, I did a job with 1,300 VAV boxes all wireless in Chicago. And it, was, it worked awesome. It was great because uh, they didn't have to use any wire for the sensor bus. They didn't have to use any wire for the communication bus. And uh, in Chicago, it all has to be a conduit. So there's a big labor savings and time savings and cost savings. The hard part is that you got to get your electrical to agree to it, right? The electrical is going, well, you're taking away all my work. Okay? But you're not, though, actually. They still have to mount the VAV controller. They still have to address it. They still have to bring power to it. They're just not stringing, you know, daisy chain bus to each one of the devices, and they're not stringing bus from the controller to the sensor, right? So you got to find somebody that's good to like to work with. And go, guess what? We win more jobs if you do this, and that way it works. And also, so there's some people that like, you know, like the wireless option for things like, you know what? We have an aesthetically important building. I can't fish wire through this, right? Or I want to put a sensor on like a, a marble wall or a glass wall, right? Now I can do that and be able to do it. Or like the sensor. We also have a sensor that's like this, uh, the refrigerator, the freezer sensor. We also have one that looks like a, um, it looks like that's just an up-down button, and it's got a tether on it, so you can put it at the hospitals. How many times you go to a hospital, and they go, well, guess what? I take a lot of time with the nurses, calling and going, hey, nurse, I'm hot, I'm cold, whatever. Now you can just hang that thing on the side of the bed, go up, down, up, down. On the wireless sensors, um, what's the average battery life, and is there an indication, give you any kind of warning that you're running low? Yeah, the um, the standard, you can use standard regular batteries, right? Energizer batteries, whatever you want to pick, AA batteries, and they'll last five years of life. If you use the lithium ones, they'll go up to seven years of life on those. So, in one sense, it's good. Hey, you don't have to worry about them. Second sense is yes, I'm going to have to replace batteries at some point in the future. Indication, you can take a point and program it from here to go to my supervisory device, low battery, right? So you get a warning that says, guess what? Room 127, low battery. It does have that point that's available to you to, to nap in. 
it's up to you to use it and map it. What, I mean, in continuation of that, what happens if the battery does go dead to the temperature of the room? You would get an alarm saying that the battery don't have its own temperature anymore. And that, does it default to something? Whatever you put in is a default. You can put in any front of the controls, you put a default value in there, Perfect. and guess what? Yes. I, I lost my zone temperature, I would default to 70 degrees and alarm change of batteries. I got no sensor, I lost my sensor. Do you have a DAV controller with the wireless built in, or do you have to add the wireless? Yeah, each one of the controllers are the same uh, for wired or wireless. So if I have a PCG controller, a PCA controller, a PCB or a PCX controller, that's here, they're all standard. If I want to make it wireless, I put the 128 switch to on and plug in a flag. And that makes it a wireless device. Okay? So there's nothing with it built in, you just add the flag after. Right. How does that affect your warranty quality? Like on the system you've got drawn there? Yeah. Let's say uh, they're doing a renovation, they want to add a couple offices. You hang a flag off from the existing and then pick, pick up a wireless and not disturb your wire bus as far as Correct. technology goes? Now I'll show you I'll show you that, yes. You can have wired and wireless stuff going together. It's actually nice because you don't have to go back and go, all right, this thing's been in here for a year. i got to put something over here. Where's the end of my bus? Am I T-tapping? Right. Am I starring it? You know, not. I just plug a controller in there, give it power, plug a flag in there. And I've got this uh, coordinator, which I'll show you. I think it's, there's one right in, in, this, in this box right here. You can see it. But as long as I have a coordinator, I can do a wireless bus. It just jumps onto the network, and it's there. Yeah. So SA bus, I guess. SA bus, just so you know, is I can use this for just sensor wireless. I'm still using communication from device to device. I'm still using my data chain from device to device. I can just use a, a wireless sensor bus if I put that WRZ7860 device here. Cool. All right. Sensor action error bus is an MSTB slave bus. So how many devices can I put on there? No more than 10. The number is dependent upon how much power each one of them draws, right? So you look at how much power each one of them is drawing. It's usually about, you know, four or five sensors, maybe three expansion modules, maybe four expansion modules. You know, you're going to get to a spot where you're filling up the controller with more logic with, you know, more than four type of expansions, right? You're talking about something pretty big at that point. Uh, 1,200 feet for independently devoured uh, power devices, 500 uh, for using the screw terminals, and 100 feet between sensor and controller. So I've got a controller up here, a VAV controller. I've got an RJ12 connection on a wire. I can go 100 feet to the sensor. Okay. Any questions about that? All right. And by the way, this this presentation and ones like it or you'll see today the supervisory one. These are all posted on our ProFX user community where you can get them. So if you want to take these things and modify them in any way, put your logos on them, do whatever you want, just use the pictures, whatever you want. These are all available to you to use if for like sales presentations or whatever you want to do. So um, they're available for you. Wireless field bus sensing, that's an option, right? And so what this is, is now I've got a supervisory controller. And normally I have you know, a daisy chain going from device to device to device to device, right? In the wireless sensor option, I, the only thing I wear actually to the, uh, to the supervisory device is a coordinator. And this guy can handle up to 30 devices. Okay, 30, 35 devices. 35 devices up here. So that means I'm eliminating sensor bus wiring and I'm eliminating communication bus wiring. Okay. In this scenario, where I have a fully wireless system, I can have up to nine sensors going in. So guess what? I've got a, a room sensor. I got a refrigerator sensor. I got a couple more over here that I'm averaging or high low signal select or individual values that I want to do something with. I can have nine sensors going to that particular controller or wireless configuration. Okay? And plus it supports wired device, wired bus, and wireless uh, bus. So in your example, we do a lot in like in hospitals, right? <coughs> Where the OR room, you know, the MRI machine has to be wired because that thing kicks off a lot of magnetic you know, interference, right? So it has to be wired there. But then this might be the office building, right? Or the record room, or whatever else. Maybe the pharmacy, right? And so then I have all this stuff here wireless. And the cool part about it is that if you have to configure anything like, oh, guess what? We put a sensor on the wall today, like this, and they want to put a, you know, a coffee machine. They want to put a copy machine, right? And they got to move it over to here. Right? My classic example of that is uh, the Willis Tower in Chicago, Sears Tower, now the Willis Tower. To move a sensor from here to here, what do you think it costs? <laughs> Guesses? 4500 
But yeah, well, 1300 bucks. 1300 bucks to move my sensor from here to here. Because all in conduit, right? So the guys are like, wait a minute, are you saying I can move my sensor? Just take off the double sided tape or just whatever? I mean, they still gotta put the screws in there, right? And so they still gotta, you know, mud those things up. But they can move from here to here. Much easier for the guys that need to reconfigure. Right? So it's, it's a great option to have. You can do fully wireless, sensor bus, and con bus, or just sensor bus. That's up to you. So many nodes for you know, so many feet. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like four thousand feet. If you have, you said you had thirty something. Yeah, you get thirty devi thirty five devices <coughs> per acre. Is that not the quantity of wire devices? Up? No, same same up. They're, they're, you all see when you discover them on your backnet bus, they all show up as just a controller. It doesn't say I'm a wireless controller or anything like that. They all show up the same the same amount of devices. So, like say if I have an FX sixty. You know, what do you put on there? Maybe like, you know, 60 devices, maybe 70s, you put maybe 100 devices, 30s, maybe put 20, 30 devices. Depending upon how many points you're going back and forth, how many graphics, how many trends, same amounts here. It's all the same. You can do multiple coordinators. Oh, yeah. For yeah. Kind of question. Yeah. Can, can you do a peer to peer standalone network wireless? Throw in the supervisor and just have that coordinator and put half a dozen controllers out there talking to each other wirelessly. I'm gonna say yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm saying you can. Really. I never tried it, but I'm saying you can. You have to. You have to have a coordinator. <laughs> All right. Great. Wilmer right. 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 yeah. will, 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 will test it out. Yes, exactly. Wilmer will test it. Yeah. Wilmer will test it. Yeah. So uh, yeah. I'm gonna say you can. Like a question for the, huh? Be good to have a PCG or something, some sort of a display, some interface, something. Yeah, yeah, that's and that's the that, and that's the tough part, right? If I don't have a supervisory device, what's my interface? The display. Right? It's the display, or it's CCT, PCT, which to an owner operator, PCT is very intimidating, right? To you guys who are all smart, it's not that intimidating. To owner operators, that's very intimidating. So, I bet you can, but I'm saying probably. You'd want some sort of interface like that. It might be, it might be worthwhile. Or put a, like a PCO alarm on one of your outputs, beep. And right. Just well, we've done a peer-to-peer -peer application with no supervisor. It has a display on the PCG. It's actually a little zone control thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I was just thinking that probably would would be a good application for for wireless. If, if, you know, it depends on the building. Sometimes yeah. running wire is not that hard, but. Uh, that's exactly it. I mean, some guys go we, uh, new construction run wire cost me nothing, right? So whatever, right? But it's always a nice option for the owners at the end to be able to move their sensors around. If they're going to add or change, right? I'm going to put another PAB box up there. I'm going to add another device. It's a good option. Wherever they're mounting the sensors, it's a good option. You know, it's an old building. There might be asbestos. All right. Well, guess what? I got a solution for you, right? You know, put that sensor on the wall. I don't have to run any wire. I don't have to fish any wire through the whole thing, right? Um, museums, right? Oh God, this is a beautiful place. It's got baseboard and all this stuff, and I can't run anywhere here. You can't drill any holes. Perfect application for it. Just so you know, it's, it's available to you, and you can use it, and it works. It works really well, right? So in your application, I probably would do, if I'm doing peer-to-peer, -peer, I'd do peer-to-peer, -peer, run the wire through it, and then just do wireless sensor bus, maybe. But I think you can just do coordinator only and devices and go peer-to-peer. -peer. I think that's a possibility. I would say yes. There's some fairly inexpensive little LC pair of color backnet displays you could create. Yeah, so. yeah. We're uh, we're working on it as well. It's like a backnet interface. Yeah. You know, it's the touch screen and stuff like that to be able to new for students who don't have a computer. I got still having problems with this. And again, uh, no special controllers are required. So these are all of our standard controllers. All you do is you take standard controller, 128 switch on, plug in the flag, use the coordinator, and I'm good to go. On the peer to peer and the also the standard bus traffic, um, when do you start running into collisions? I mean, how do you know? <coughs> Other than the shark, you know? Yeah. Something like that. Well, what we've done, and as part of the supervisory device, mm -hmm. part of this, the software, when you import a controller, and I'll show you that later, I have an application called a CAF file. Right, that I downloaded into here that says you are an AHU or you're a rooftop unit or you're a fan coil, whatever the case might be. When you discover it with this guy, it brings in the points and also configures them for the right tuning policy. Right. Depending upon whether you're peer to peer, you 
can configure it for that from a hardware input, from a set point, right? I don't want to pull a set point or a, you know a, a fixed parameter like my integration time, right? If that's a point at map, I don't want to go pulling for that all the time, right? I just want to pull for that one maybe once a day or whatever, right? Even if that, if at all. So they're all configured so they have the right tuning policies for each one of the devices. But it doesn't know. You know, give you an example, you've got peer-to-peer -peer on important stuff. Right. That even if the front end goes down, you want this stuff to work. And and the front end doesn't know what's out there. You can configure it for peer-to-peer -peer communications. In your device. Oh. I'll show you where. Well, in the device, yes. I mean, okay, what I'm yeah. getting at. In, in the network. In the, in oh, the in, the, in the supervisor. Yes, yes. Oh. You can configure it for that. Oh, okay. Yeah, you can configure it and say, what's my tuning policy? We've set them up so that you get them, and you can pick Oh, you do have a peer-to-peer. Peer -peer. Yes. I didn't see that. Yeah, okay. that's in there. That's in there. So they're configured with the right way to communicate. So that's one of the benefits of using the controllers and using this, right? Okay. You've got automatic, it says, all right, guess what, I'm pulling this device in here. Well, oh, I know this is a set point. I know this is an analog value. I know something. You'd have to tell it it's peer-to-peer. -peer. It won't know automatically right. it's peer-to-peer -peer if that's what it's doing, right? So what Dave's referring to is, well, I want this guy to send a value to this guy and these two guys to communicate. You'd have to tell it that. It doesn't know these two guys are communicating to each other. This guy doesn't. Okay. But you can, I'll, show, I'll show you what I mean by that. Uh, battery power test, we get five years of life to seven years of life with a lithium, you know, AA battery. Right? So it's great, gives you an indication, it's bad, I have to get rid of batteries. I want them to push for a sensor that's got like a little, uh, you know, thing like your uh, calculators, right? A little, you know, solar thing right here that harvests the light or something like that. So you don't have to deal with batteries at all. That's in the future. But today you have to do two AA batteries, just standard, right? So they get a recycle the batteries. Um, one to one sensing option, I think we went over this too as well. As if I have any controller, I can add this WRZ7860 and I can have up to five wireless sensors here. And again, that's kind of cool because like the safety system, right? I got a VAB box controller up here, I got my sensor on the wall, and I also have like a refrigerator over here, right? And I want to take that refrigerator and catalog that time. I can add that refrigerator freezer sensor on there, no problem. <coughs> Any questions on the PC controllers? On that WRD, the wireless receiver right there, mm -hmm. what kind of range are you getting on that? Is there a limit with the ceiling grids and everything where that's got to be above the ceiling? Or not? Right. Um, anywhere from like 50 to 250 feet, depending upon what's in between. And uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll jump to that so you guys can see. It seems like there's a lot of questions on wireless, so I'll show you how the thing works gives you a bit better idea of it, but it casts out a bubble just like the flags do. They go and they cast out their bubble. The strongest point is, you know, straight ahead and they go like this and it's a big bubble. In this line, on the same plane, is the strongest thing, right? Strongest signal, right? So my, my large installation of the wireless stuff like this guy, let's see what, of this scenario right here is a building in Chicago, right? At 1,300 VAV boxes wireless. Every floor had 70 VAV boxes. We did a coordinator on each floor, two coordinators on each floor, each one would get 35 devices, then we just strung the trunk up the elevator shaft, right? And so this guy right again, cast out a big bubble. These guys all cast out a bubble, because the bubbles overlap, I've got communication going between the two of them. Okay? So, do we want to uh, see more wireless stuff, or do you guys want to go into the controllers each individually? You know, like I have a thing right here, like yeah, feed boxes, right? Right. You need to go through. Don't need to go through like the wall in the basement. For the okay. I still have two. So five. let's go down to it is the wireless worse. stuff. Yeah. 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 The, the old system. system. All right. I will do it all. That was terrible. Um, oh, one thing that's kind of important. That's uh, let's see here once. Let me just do this oh, this slide right here. With the, with the Today we have three models of. VAV box controllers, right? The VAV controllers, the PCBs. We got ones a 1615, a 1630, or an 1832. The 1832 today speaks N2. Okay? So you come across the installation, you got the VMA 1400s, and you want to replace one. <coughs> the VMA 1400s are still available, but eventually they're going to go end of life, right? We're depleting our whole stock of them, we can't make them anymore. You can replace it with a PCB 1832. Is our only N2 model of the white controllers with PCT 10.1, again, announced in December, shipping in January. I can make any one of the controllers an N2 controller. 
That's cool, isn't it? So all the places where you go to and there's an S2 installation, they got to fail AHU, they got to fail UNT. I can use a PC controller, say, program it for whatever, say I want to make this N2. It has N2 communications and it comes up with the point types that match up N2 communication protocol. So ADIs, ADOs, BDs, BIs, whatever. So you can actually map it in so you can take one off the wall, put this one in there, and it's the same point types, the same point names. That's going to be the branch guys happy Well, that's the whole thing. I don't know why they, I don't know why they did it. That's my, whole, that's my whole thing. I'm going, yeah, it's a great idea. It helps them out, but boy, it helps you guys out a whole lot more. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? It helps you more. I think it's a great thing. I think it's an awesome thing, right? So today, we only have one end communicating device, a PCB 1832. In January, you'll be able to make any one of the controllers that you buy today an N2 device. Is it, uh, if it's an existing installation, can you flash the existing controller? Or does it only bring the controller on that jam it up? Yeah. yeah, what you, like say if you have an existing UNT controller? No, like you know, you've got an existing, existing. PCG oh. G <coughs> 1621 or whatever it might be. Yes. And uh, you'd like, like to take that one into, yes. but it's two years old or whatever. Exactly. You can do that. You just upgrade the firmware in it okay. with the latest or own PCT, and you can make it an N2 controller. And also, what you can do is, let's say you've got, you know, is that, uh, is that just for the controller, you can go bust. Hmm? Well, that's the whole thing. It's like this. Let's say today you go with something like this. I've got an NAE here, right? Or a companion, even better, right? Companion. Oh. Right? And I've got an N2 bus with devices on there, right? I got these on there. And let's say, all right, so this guy right here was a UNT, I replaced it with a PCG controller. And then I come along this way and I can replace this one with a PCG controller, UNT. So I got one more here. Hey, Mr. Customer, if you want to, I can really do one better for you. I can replace this old companion that didn't have internet connectivity, doesn't have graphics, doesn't have anything. I can put an FX here, FX supervisor, you know, or 30, whatever I want to do. I can make this a PCG controller and flash these all that were N2. I can flash them all back in now. So now you have a vendor independent bus of stuff that you can add third party stuff on there. Doesn't have to be an N2, right? So you can flash it all the back then. You can do what you want. I can replace the N2 stuff and leave it at N2. Once I get to a bursting limit of devices on that bus, I can flash them all back net. Now I have a back net bus and I can add third party stuff onto it. That's pretty cool. Right? That's good for you guys. I go one point a step further. If you do that, is the wireless still available on um, Wireless uh, is available on N2 for this part. So if I have an N2 controller, if I have a PC controller, I can put a WRZ and do a wireless communication to a sensor. So it's like a safety back to the two Right. I can't do a, a, a coordinator, coordinator like this. This is an N2 bus. I cannot do this. I can't put a coordinator yeah, and a controller, and a controller, and a controller. I can't do that. Okay. I can only do the wireless sensor bus on N2. So all of the wireless stuff we're talking about, wireless sensor bus and communication bus, those are all with the white controllers, the PC controllers. It doesn't work with N2. Okay. That's surprising. Hmm? Surprising. It's good for us. It's, it's awesome. It's awesome for you guys. So all those branch installations that you guys come across, I'm like, can I get an N2 controller? Now you can support all that stuff and you eventually swap out the NAE or the Companion or the N30 and put it in an FX supervisor. Customers complain. If you put a PCB1832 on a, you know, in that scenario right there, mm -hmm. you, you replace an N2 with a PC, replace another one, eventually you get to the point where, hey, we're close enough, we can replace them all. Can you flash that into PCB back to MSDP? Yes, you can. Okay. Yes, you will be able to. Yep. So it's just the same things. It's just we, were, we didn't get up. We said we had to do something because the whole scenario was the place where we make our, the place where we get our components for the VMA 1400s, a lot of the components are made in Japan. And remember that tsunami that hit there? That took out the whole factory. And they're like, we need more stuff. And they're like, guess what? We can't make any. We have no factory. So it was like, oh my God, we gotta do something fast, right? And so they made this, figuring, gosh, you know, there's we sell, you know, 250,000 VAV controllers a year. So they're all over the place. It's not like you go to any hospital here and go, guess what? I'm gonna take your wing down, 
right? You know what I mean? <laughs> right? I mean, you can't, so we had to have a solution for that, right? The UNTs and stuff like that, I mean, yeah, you can figure out a way to get around that, right? But the VAV control is really good, so that's why we created this thing. And then they got smart and said, guess what? I'm going to go through, put it in PCT, where I go through PCT, do my question and answer, actually, actually add my program and go, I'm going to make this an AHU controller. I'm going to make it a UNT controller. I'm going to make it a VAV controller. Boom, and so the points come out like that. And so this guy would be flashable N2, or uh, back net once 10 one comes out. Okay. So. When's 10 one coming out? 10 one is coming out, it's, it's due to be released. Uh, to RTS, which we call release to sales in December, is shipping in January. That's what they flagged right now. Is that engineering say that or marketing? <laughs> 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 engineering says January, just not what year, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Alright, so here, let's take a look at some of the wireless stuff. Alright, so wireless bus system. And again, I think we saw this uh, example already. So, send a supervisory device to a coordinator. That's the only thing that's on there if you want to. And then all of your devices after that, right? So, my up to nine sensors that go with that. I can have wired and wireless existing at the same time, right? And no special controllers. So, all the same controllers. It's just the standard controller, 128 switch on, and flag plugged in there. Because you can have 35 devices. Each one of these guys, a coordinator, has a PAN, or personal area network. So this might be pan number one, next one another pan number two, next one another pan number three. And I just do that. Each one of the controllers report to their respective coordinator. And that's how it gets communicated back to the supervisory device. Each one of the sensors, if you take a look at the dip switches on the back, it goes, oh, guess what? I know what controller I'm talking to. So you set the dip switches to say, I'm talking to controller number 10, and I'm on personal area network number five, so it knows where I'm going. Right? So you can take the sensor off the wall someplace, and put it in the refrigerator, <laughs> right? Wherever you want to, it'll hop up on the network, ride around, and go, guess what? I know I'm on personal area network five, and I'm going to this controller, I'm really cold, turn up the heat, right? So you can play funny jokes on somebody in a room. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? It'll find, it, it'll find its way back. So even, even though that sensor might not be on the, talking to the same wireless flag, it'll still find its way back through the network. It hops up on the mesh, and I'll, I'll show you what that mesh is, right? So the technology that we have is called Zigbee, right? So that's not something that John's Control has created. It's something that a bunch of HVAC people came together and said, we have to find a way to do this thing wireless, right? So they came up with the Zigbee Alliance. It speaks on the you know, Wi-Fi layer, but this, the, the, the channels that it uses are channels that are not used by Wi-Fi, and the messages are very short, right? I'm awake, I'm transmitting my values, I'm going back to sleep, okay? So there's no interference from cell phones or Bluetooth or you know, wireless cell phones, anything like that, right? So there's no interference from all that stuff. It's quiet channels that use it, right? It's direct sequence spread spectrum technology, which means that only the radio that's in the sensor has a, a chip in there, and the controller, the flag, has a chip in there, so it knows I'm speaking to you, and I'm gonna take out all the other noise that's there to ensure communication between the two of them, right? So this is a technology that's used by many companies. There's two competing ones, Zigbee and Notion, kind of like VHS and Beta, and they're still competing, right? And we've chosen Zigbee, and it's very successful, right? So that's the way it goes. Uh, quiet Wi-Fi channels, low power levels, so that's why you get five years of life out of that battery, right? And it's got a redundant path. So hopefully this picture, I think, of the next one here, will show you what, uh, what I mean by a redundant path and self-healing. That's also uh, personal area networks again. So at my coordinator, I'm a personal area network here. The next coordinator, personal area network there. So I know who I'm communicating to and what I'm communicating. So let's see an example. Let's say this is the floor. And I didn't do this example. I'd have done it totally different. But maybe maybe this is a big atrium, right? And the, so the ceiling is way up here, and they couldn't hang a coordinator there. For some reason, they put the coordinator here. And this is a 25-foot circle. When I do the uh, takeoffs for this, I put a 50-foot circle on there for new construction today. No problem doing that. So it's kind of a small circle in a weird location. But that's the coordinator that's connected to the supervisory device. Okay? And then so each one of these guys around here will be a router. That's a VAV box with a flag in it, let's say. And it's casting out its bubble. With me so far? Right? And so then it'll go through and each one of those VAV boxes, wherever they are, will also cast out their bubble. As long as the bubbles overlap, it's like I've got communication going between those particular devices. When you guys power up, it says, what are the six ways I can pass on my information? 
So everybody that's you know close to it, it'll pass on the information to it. So in this scenario right here, it's only a 25 foot circle, but I do a 50 foot circle, and boy, you got overlapping communications, right? But as you can see here, how does this guy get a signal back to the coordinator? It can't, right? It'll pass through jump, 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 jump. It can't get there, right? So if you want to, and you got a scenario like this, let's say I've got um, you know, a controller here with a flag, and let's say I've got a sensor, I've got another controller over here, right, with a flag, and this circle is here, and this circle is here. They're not overlapping, so they can't pass on their stuff to get back to the coordinator. So that's what we're looking at. So this guy has no way to get to here, right? What I can do is I can just power up a flag. We've got like a, a J box and a, and a flag assembly. So you just power those up separately. And you put those guys in there, and they're repeaters. We call them repeaters, right? So flag only, not plugged into the controller. So you use that to fill in the gaps as they go along. So what, what does that repeater look like? So it's a, like a power box, a flag, a J box? Just with the flag. It's, a, it's a metal yeah. J box with a flag. I don't know where the little four by four box and then Flag system. You just plug it in with the RJ12 connection in there, right? So if you want to, you can do that, right? But I've, I've had very few installations, you know, VAP boxes, fan coils, things like that, but there's a lot of them in the area. It just bursts out a signal and they're overlapping, right? And we do have a tool, and it looks like the uh, where the WRZ7860 is, wherever that thing is. Uh, I don't know. Here. Yeah, we're gonna, have, we're gonna have one of those guys snatch them. Get it out of your pocket. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Here, this guy and this guy. So you take a regular sensor like this, and then there's a it's called a wireless sensing tool. So it's basically this with like a little battery pack on the back. So you can take this thing and put it where you have one flag. You go to the spot where you have another flag. You hit the button on the side, press it. If I get on these guys, the display it'll show like a, a graduated scale. You know, it explains a whole lot better mm -hmm. than, the, than the light. Yeah, it shows like this. It shows like this. You know, one, two, three. So if you have one, two, three, I've got great communication. If you've got two, it's still okay. If you've got one, that might be, you know, you might have a tendency for there, like might be something in the way, right? Elevator shaft, you know, the, the signal is attenuated somewhat. So you can go there and at least see if, you know, if I'm sitting here, I can put the sensor in the room next door, hit the button and see, oh, guess what? <coughs> Do I have communication between them? If you have no display, it's just a, a little LED on there. One, two, or three blinks. Question for Peter. Uh, do you battery power the inverting desk? Yeah, yeah. This guy right here has got a, a battery option to it for the, te for the, for the testing tool. Well, the flag you're talking about, you know, putting a repeater flag in. Yeah. Um, what I'm thinking is, you've got a job and you're done, and they start, uh, when, when the job on my contractor did was a library. Work great. They start putting these steel cases up for books and filling them with books. Then you get all this interference after the fact. So uh, concrete building, now you got to go back and run power to your computer. Yes, I don't you know do. if, they, if they had a power list or a battery list. Which you, you, you can just use a power great right? What? You can use another stat. No, you can't no, use no, a stat. You, you can't use a stat because the stats so you have to use jump up onto this mesh. So these guys are all controllers with flags in them. What about one of them? No, you need a, you need to put a flag there. <laughs> yes, you do. They power twenty four volts. That's kind of. Yeah. If they had something with a you know, lithium battery or something that would last for a couple three years in your uber, uh, probably get a quick fix. Right. It'd be hard to power that. Yeah, would it? Because it's gonna have. It's gonna, it's gonna be running all the time, right? Where's the? Right. Yeah, the set the stats with batteries in them. They communicate every like five minutes, right? Wake up, send my value. So if you have a display on it, it powers the display all the time. It's displayed showing, showing my space temperature. If I move the thing for set point adjust or warmer cooler, right, that'll work, right? And then it just wakes up, sends its value, and then goes back to sleep, right? Whereas the coordinator is powered all the time. And that's one of the that's one of the that's one of the big big problems that people do for their first wireless jobs is they'll turn the stats on. Right? And they'll have no coordinator to talk to or no controller. So the thing is constantly going, hey, I'm 72, hey, I'm 72, hey, I'm 72, hey, I'm 72, right? And then it runs out of batteries in you know, three months. <laughs> right? Because it's totally on all the time. Right? So the key to this is take the stats, keep them, don't turn them on. Right? Once you have your coordinator up and your controllers up, then power the stats on. You can mount them, just don't power them on. There's a little switch in the back right here, power on. 
And on the back of these guys, you put a little thing over there, a little uh, white piece of paper. It shows whether I'm one to one, meaning I'm doing the WRC7860 communication from full mesh. You put that over there, it tells you what to do with the dip switches. And so, let's see what's here. Uh, this guy here, as you can see, this one is a one to one application. So it shows what you can do with the, with the dip switches, what they mean. And uh, so what you do is you, you mount them, but you don't turn them on, right? So they don't sit there and go, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, right? Because if they got somebody to talk to, they go, oh yes, I know who I'm talking to, I'm going to go back to sleep. So it is a two-way communication? Well, yeah. Because... Yeah, it's a communication between the sensor and the controller, this guy right here, filled with a flag in there, okay? These guys create the mesh, the flags create the mesh, and the coordinator creates the mesh. The sensors just ride on it. So like I said before, maybe the sensor for this guy is mounted on the wall right here. And let's say this is personal area network number seven, right? I can take the sensor off the wall, go all the way over here, right, and mount it over here. It'll hop up here and go, oh, you know what? I need to go back to this controller over here. So it'll hop up on here and go bump, 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 bump. I'll communicate my value to this guy. So it doesn't form, the sensors don't form the mesh. Can the sensor and the controller be on separate panes? No. Okay. No. Because you said it, it, it's kind of flat. So if you had like a, a three-story atrium and the VAV box is up on the third floor and the sensor's down here in the lobby, you got a problem getting it. Right. You, well, what you could do is this. Let's say this is floor three, floor two, floor one, right? And let's say the controller is up here, controller is up here with my flag in it, right? And this is personal area network, pan number three, let's say, okay? And that's set by the flag. If you take a look at the flag, it's got dip switches on to set the pan, right? And so this guy is pan three. I can put a flag here, that's pan three. And I can put a flag here, that's pan three. And I can put a sensor right here, that's pan three. And as long as this circle, this circle, this circle, and this circle are overlapping, I can do the communication that way. Okay? But that's kind of a bad, that's kind of a bad scenario. It's a, it's a risky one because if this guy goes out right here, you know, I take this guy down for whatever reason. Now this guy has no place to pass on its signal, right? And so this controller is going to go, oh, guess what? I'm just going to go to my default of 72 or whatever I program and put up an alarm. It's still going to control, right? It's still going to control the piece of equipment. It's not going to have a space temperature value, right? So your worst scenario for wireless stuff is like a tra uh, uh, train tracks, right? If I'm going like this and like this and like this, and the guy in the middle goes out, this guy has no way to pass on a signal, right? So you want a mesh thing like this. So here's how it might be formed, right? I've got all my controllers with the flags in them. I've got some repeaters to fill in the gaps, and the key here is that oh, my communication path. I'm going to jump, jump, jump and jump. You don't have to specify this, it automatically does this, this is what Zigbee does. What's my most efficient way? I know I can go do 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 to get here, but I won't do that because it takes too long. I'm going to go find my most efficient path. So when this network forms, it takes like 15 minutes for it to go, what's my most efficient path back to my coordinator? All right? And the key part about this is if something would go out, like say this repeater would go down, I'm servicing it, it might be a controller, I got a VAB box down, I got to do something else, it'll automatically reform its path to be able to find its way back to the coordinator. You don't have to tell it to do that, it'll automatically do it. Because when each one of these guys power up, they go, oh, who can I pass my signal on to? Right? They'll go, hello, 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 nope, okay, I'll choose my other path. So this wireless stuff is really good for space temperature. If I'm doing process control or anything like that, not so good, right? Because this process right here could take, you know, five to seven minutes to reform. Right? So if I need a, a temperature value every minute, I'm not getting it, that's not the right way to go. Right? The controllers are still working, it's just that I don't have that value to go back to the supervisory device. Okay? So the controller's not down, but if I have a trend that I have to get every minute, if this guy goes down, this takes five minutes, I've lost five minutes worth of trend values. Okay? So it's really made for space temperature, not for process control. Are we good on this? You've got a wireless duct sensor, right? Uh, no. Oh, okay. I thought I. Right. No, we've got a, a sensor that sits on the SA bus for duct. Right. Right. It's a wired device, but no wireless duct sensor. Right. 
the, in, uh, in Ocean, and again, this is great technology. In Ocean has one that you take and you can put into like a pipe or something like that, and the difference in temperature is kind of like a thermal column between what's in the pipe and what the ambient air is. It creates enough electricity to be able to say, guess what? Um, 55 degree water or 32 degree water, it'll send a signal up, right? So great technology, works the same. You get to do more repeaters and more, more gap fillers with an ocean than you do with Zigbee. So it's up to you, but it's a great technology and everybody should really kind of do it. I, 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 I tell this story too is when I was in Chicago doing that VAV box job for 1,300 VAV boxes, the engineer at ESD goes, no, I'm not doing wireless. I don't like wireless. Hold on a second, I got a call. It's his wireless phone, yeah. it's his wireless Bluetooth in his ear, and it starts <laughs> tapping away at his wireless computer and says, I don't believe in wireless. You know what I mean? It's just going to get better, right? The first initial forays into this wasn't so good because it had to be one-to-one, -one, it had to be line of sight, you know what I mean? It was you know, pretty, pretty sticky, right? It's getting better and better. Well, the two things with, with the ability to put a flag is a patch, so to speak. Mm -hmm. After the fact, uh, it's a big deal. And if you've got some white paper where you've shown stuff, with engineers, two things about engineers. They don't have enough, mechanicals don't get enough money from an architect to spend a lot of time on the job. So they use previous job most of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and for them to jump out on a limb and say wireless without any kind of backup is, is uh, not something a lot of engineers are willing to do. So if you got some white papers that these guys want to get to, uh, and you yeah. know, tell me, look, if it fails, we can put a patch in here and you know, it works. Right. And that's the thing is that if you guys want to do a wireless job and it's anything of significance that you want to do a white paper on to show, guess what? We saved labor hours, we saved whatever we did, I'd be more than happy to do it. It's just hard because every one of you guys that are out here doesn't really want to do this for John's Controls, right? They want to do it for their mechanical contractor company, right? This is our deal, not John's Controls deal. But if you want to do it, I'd be more than happy to do it. I'd ask everybody. Let's do it. We've done tons of jobs to just kind of fall flat. And if that's the case, you want to do it, and you'll, you'll get your customer to you know, agree to this thing, I'll give you a supervisor device or a couple of them or some of the wireless stuff to cut your costs down, and we'll just do it, right? You just got to commit to say, guess what, I want to do a wireless job and I want to put it, and we'll publish it and then when you get a white paper, you can hand it out to everybody, right? I'm just having the hardest time with anybody, you know, to actually do a white paper. If you call on engineers and they get that press, that speaks for their firm. Oh yeah, uh, exactly. So if you work with some engineering firm, you do this and go, guess what, we saved X amount of dollars, it's great, I can do changes, I can do whatever I want, I got sensors all over the place, you know, what I can't measure, I can't, you know, act on, right, and I got sensors all over the place. If you guys want to do it, I'd be more than happy to do it. Work with you, give me some free stuff, and we'll work on this paper that you can hand out and we'll publish it across everything. It's just hard to find. Right? I'd love to do it. I'd love to do it. Johnson Branches, no problem. You get tons of those, right? ABCSs, customers of ABCS distributors, I have nothing. Everybody says yes, 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 I want to do it, and then they, they don't do it. So there's, there's jobs out there. It's just oh, the ones really That's exactly it. I don't, know what, I don't know if it's the fact that oh, guess what? I'm doing something for jobs controls that holds them back, or what it is, right? But if you want to do it, I'd be more than happy to do it. Like I said, I'll give you some coordinators. I'll give you a supervisor. I'll give you some flags. Whatever. We'll, we'll work together to make it to make it happen. Well, the market okay. way is kind of services. What's driving the unexpected shit right now? Right. So this really helps on the service side to go in and execute a job very quickly. Oh yeah, and not only that too, I think the, the key to this is also it's like, I still have Johnson Branches installing N2 devices because they think, oh guess what, it's my job, nobody else can yeah. do it, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> think about putting in a wireless backnet network. The, all the messages are backnet through the air. Think about doing this, nobody else can do this. Talk about having a customer, right? You'll have them forever and ever and ever, right? Who else can do it? Nobody. Johnson Branch can, but you know they have different devices. Same, same technology, same stuff, right? But at least you know you're eliminating most of the playing field because you put this in. Now it's really your job. So whatever, it's, it's a thought. So if you want to do a, if you want to do a job, I'd love to have. Oh, Indianapolis, we did this building. It's all wireless. It's great. I mean, I've done you know office facilities, I've done medical facilities, I've done all kinds of stuff, and it works. It's good stuff. The key is the layout, right? If it was me doing this thing, I'd put that communicating the, the, the coordinator right here in this spot. So I have multiple paths from everywhere to get back to this guy. You know, they, they put it up here in this example, and I'm not PowerPoint smart enough to be able to change it. So any any questions? Cool. So
So that, that's the coordinator, that's what it looks like. There's one in that box right here. And the flag comes as the thing that you can mount remotely. So it's usually put into a 11 by 13 box. We, we, we manufacture it that way. Or you can get it by itself if you have your own box. So you can mount the flag outside of the metal enclosure. Right? So that guy is the wired interface of the backnet network. It communicates to the PC controllers. It starts the wireless network. The flags we pass around, those guys are all plugged into the controllers, right? Plugs into the PC controllers, the PCBs, PCAs, PCBs, PCXs. Plugs into all those guys, right? And so that's the flag that you plug in. And there's that dip switch right here, and that's my personality <coughs> network number. So the coordinator has a personality network, the flags have a personality network, and the, uh, the sensor in the back. You put the personality network on there so they know who I'm talking to, what controller, and what personality area and network I'm on. So the personal area network is set by the so you just have to set everything that's on that all the same it's set on this guy right here set on that one right there this and everything else that talks to that has to follow suit correct everything that talks to this guy's in the same personal area network so the flags like so if this is personal area network eight <laughs> which is here every every flag and the controllers that talk to it are eight on the sensor it has a, a switch a settings for what controller am I talking to Right? So this might be controller number seven. So I'm talking controller number seven, <coughs> personal area network number three. Right? So they all follow suit. And you, you can get our VAV boxes with the flags already mounted on it and everything too. Yeah. So it's already done. That was that was what controller, the reason. Yeah, wireless flag, everything. That was the reason for the design like this. We thought, guess what, we're probably mounted by VAV boxes the most because it creates a good mesh. So this thing is configured this way to get above the control enclosure and be able to point it whatever direction you want to point it. You can, you can do like that too if you want to, whatever you want to do, right? But that's it. And so when these guys ship from the factory, I think, on a VAV box, it's actually hidden, so it ships down, you take it, you put it up like this, and you can point it wherever you want to. You want to point this part toward the coordinator, toward the mesh. That's so what it's called. the direction of the yeah, the, the, the strongest part is right here in the front, so it goes like this, it goes woof, like this, when it powers up and it goes. So it's a half moon. Yeah, well it's a full circle, it's like a bubble, it's like a bubble around it. So you can go through floors, but you know floors are, the construction right there is pretty strong, right? So that's why I put a coordinator on every floor, right? You can go through floors like this, right? But it's not recommended, it can't be done. Or like, I've had guys do this where they have a building here, like this, and I have a building here like this, and it's in proximity, they'll put the flag over here, and they put the sensor over here like this, like this, and this guy will go here, and this guy will go here. You're building to building. Not recommended. If it doesn't work, it's not like you're going to go, all right, we'll give you something for it, but it does work, right? It does what work. What about the contacts for windows? Little card reader for hotel, you put your card in for occupancy. Mm -hmm. products, we don't have any Zigbee products like that, no. They may, they may. Um, like our, our TEC stats, I don't know if you guys have seen these, but they're fixed function stats, configurable stuff for like rooftops, fan coils, so on and so forth. It comes with either backnet, LAN, or wireless. So they have their own coordinator, <coughs> like this. and this guy can have a, it's got a wired door switch. It's got a wire, you know, mini bar thing, whatever. Right? So these guys do come with wireless. Oh, yeah, we do it in. Uh, yeah, we do it in uh, dorm rooms. You know, it's great. And with the occupancy on them, so they got the little bubble on the front. I think there's one in here, like this. See that right there? For all the dorm rooms. <laughs> so when the kids leave, I don't go to control the occupied set points. I go to, you know, standby or unoccupied for whatever time. Right? They open up the window, I'm not going to turn the fan quite on. And now they don't have to fish wire through this, you know, old dorm room that's been there. It's got this. Churches. Great for that kind of stuff. Right? And it, it kind of looks cool, right? It's not too intimidating. You know, so it looks good. Uh, flag does the thing and uses the repeaters we talked about, you know, filling in gaps. So I might just have that alone. 15 volts DC. We have a J box where you take 24 volts to it. You take 24 volts to it. It transforms to 15 BDC and plug this guy into it. I think I got a picture. Here it is, right here. Here's your, so you bring 24 volts into this guy. This guy transforms to 15. You plug the flag into it. So that's what it looks like. It's a box. You can mount the flag on there. Do whatever you want. Okay. And then all the sensors that kind of go with it. Here's that picture of the uh, of the hospital sensor with the tether on it. 
the tuning rate on the uh, supervisor is only to do with the supervisor, right? Pardon me? The tunings yeah. are only to do. So can you, I know you mentioned a while ago that uh, on the Zigbee that you would only really use it for space temperature, not for process. You cannot adjust the scanning rate? Uh, no, you can't adjust the scanning rate. It's the same speed as like uh, 384 MSTP communications. So you're not losing anything, but like this temperature value every five minutes is waking up, setting it. Exactly every minute. Every minute? Yes. There you go, every minute. Yeah. Go ahead, every minute, right? It wakes up, says whoop, I'm whatever, it goes back down. And that communicates to the supervisor in the same speed that it does with the back. But what if you're doing peer-to-peer? -peer? You said you could do peer-to-peer -peer controller yeah. to controller. So that's a lot of information that might be going on the wireless. That's okay. It's acceptable. It's acceptable. It's the same, it's the same communication rate as back then. That's what all my engineers tell me. Okay. Right? So I'm still doing 38.4. So we have the refrigerator or the hospital sensor, right? Up and down arrows, right? I got the refrigerator freezer one, and I also got one for hot temperatures. So like you got a, a computer rack or something like that. I can put that thing in there, you use your own 10K sensor, whichever one you choose, talks to this guy, and I'm able to do hot temperatures. Yes? Why don't you do the up and down arrows instead of the knobs? Yeah. That's I mean, good. those knobs are yes. <clears throat> I know. pain. I know. Put it I bluntly. Know. And the funny part is I know the guy really well who got the patent for the knob. His name is Dominic DiCali. Is he with Johnson? Yes, he's, he's a sales guy now. He's left engineering <laughs> sales. He fixed it. Got yeah. a shot. I would love to get rid of this knob. I'd love to get rid of this knob. And, and you can get rid of the knob? No. And go to all up down arrows like the like the TMC sensors. You uh, might have seen those, right? Little display, up right. arrow, down arrow, real nice. Real nice. Yeah. I wish we could do that. I hammered that home. Because that sensor sometimes a knob can break. A little clutch the can yeah. break. And you can spin it around forever and ever, and you don't know what you're doing, right? <laughs> that's cool. I know. I know. But that's what we have today. So it works well. I mean, they, they, they look they look appealing, don't they? I mean, you know, they're not, they're not appealing. They're not? <laughs> no. I don't think so? Everybody's got the LCD with the with the up and down arrows, and you try to convince the customer, oh, you got to turn this thing until the display flashes. I actually had to put labels on them. To, to, for P, and, then, and then I got down there at the bottom and then leave it alone. I mean, right. you know. Right. I'll pass it on again. Yeah, they're paying. I'll pass <laughs> it on again. But yeah. Um, it was at a blind facility. <laughs> 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 for the blind. No, yeah. it's just everybody's using arrows. And no, I, I agree with you. I agree with you 100%. 100%. What they do. You pass it on. Yep. So, oh, here you go. Transmits every 60 seconds, every minute. Then I there we go. Set up. Right? Transmits every, every 60 seconds. So you can get them, you know, uh, with, or, with or without a display, with or without a knob. It's just like a little uh, opening right there to be able to sense temperature, so you don't even have anything to adjust on it. Uh, refrigerator, freezer, hospital, hot uh, temperature, and they also come with occupancy sensors. So you can walk into a room, sense its occupancy, goes to occupied set points, and maybe turns on the lights. You know, you can do that. And that's it. Wall multiple sensors, you know, temperature, temperature and humidity, uh, LCD on board, 45 years of battery life, the cold storage sensor that this guy right here, to be able to do those temperatures, negative 40 is the lowest we go. I don't know if that's low enough. You know, maybe, you know, one, Eli, one Eli, Lilly, Eli Lilly might go to like negative 80. The electronics know, like, is not negative 40. Hmm? The electronics is not negative 40. No, no, the sensor is. Yeah. The sensor. That's the big problem. So again, well, I mean, oh. this is the, the the sensor is mounted on the outside of the box. Yeah, but if it's outside, outside, you know, meaning the freezer. It's outside the freezer. No, I'm talking the whole thing's outside. outside. Oh no, it's not meant for outside. That's this, what I'm this talking. Indoor. This is indoor stuff. Yeah. Indoor stuff. Yeah. But that mounts on the outside, and then the wire goes, you know, across the seal, mounted in, in the box, right? So negative 40 to 35. And then also the warm sensor right here, up to 70 degrees C. You can use any 10K sensor you like. So you don't have to buy the sensor that comes with it. You can buy any 10K sensor, connect it up there, and use it. And lastly, the uh, handheld uh, temperature sensor up here, this guy right here, for hospitals. Right. So a couple options there for wireless. Uh, details, here we go. 250 feet from the coordinator, average 50 feet. That's why I do that 50 foot circle. The key is get a, a floor plan drawing. Get a scale out and draw your 50 foot circles around where each one of the VAD boxes or fan coils are mounted. And as they're overlapping, you got good communication between those devices. 
right? Routers are repeaters to fill in the gaps. Onboard diagnostics, so it always blinks. At first, we had to flag, it powered up, it blinks when it communicates three times, and it would stay green, which was kind of cool, right? But all the places that didn't have drop ceilings and had exposed ceilings, you know, with the newer construction, at night, you turn off all the lights, Maybe this green glow in the building. <laughs> so they redid all the, they redid it and they said when it powers up for the first half hour it's green, then after that it goes dark. Right? So at night, when it, only when it communicates it blinks and it goes back to being dark. So that's your onboard uh, LEDs. You can do it from the sensors, hit the button on the side, if it's got an LED on it, it'll blink three times for good communication. If I've got my uh, a display on it, does that graduated bar on there? One, two, three. Um, Signal strength, you got that one. LCD, you got that one. And then the site survey tool is again, WRC sensor, with a little battery pack on it, so you can go and test your installation. Hey, it's a good candidate for wireless. Right? And then one to one, we talked about this one already, and that's just the, the sensor with the WRC uh, on the SA bus. Same thing, except for I'm just talking up to five sensors for one controller. I still got days changed from device to device. So you have your options there. So this guy doesn't need a flag then, it's wireless, it just needs this, WRC7860. Right? It's a one-to-one -one system, and again, if I have to go different distances, this is far away, I can use a repeater in there to boost the signal. So let's say my controller's over here, my sensor's on the other end of the building, I can put a flag in between there to bridge the gap. So it works in that scenario as well. And if you're doing like one-to-one -one on a box, or if you want to order boxes from us, and you're just doing one to one, but you can't get that one to one. You, know, you got to get it something. Right, that makes sense. So you get a box with a controller, right? You field mount the WRZ 7860. Right. So you can't do one to one with a flag then? No, you don't want to get, if you're doing one to one, it's kind of a misnomer because you can do up to five, right? But they call it one to one. If I'm doing that, I just have the WRZ 7860. That takes the place of a flag. But if I'm doing a wireless coordinator, if I'm doing communication bus network, wireless, that's when I need the flag. Or if I'm going to bridge a gap and use it for you. Like you have redundant devices almost. Yeah, I, uh, I don't know. This, because this guy right here, for a one-to-one, -one, this guy is much less price, lower price than a coordinator, right? Why do I want to put a big boxy coordinator everywhere when I can just put this guy in there? Why would you just be able to do a flag if you're one-to-one through a flag? You can't do, I thought you could do a, a Space sensor to a flag to the PCG or the PCV, and then later on, as things branch out, you put a coordinator and all that stuff. Okay, I'd use a flag on a one to one if I'm not, if I'm bridging a gap. This sensor is way over here in this end of the building. My controller with this is over on the other end of the building, and this signal doesn't get from this sensor to this controller. I put a flag in there to bridge the gap, okay? If I'm doing wireless sensor bus and wireless communication bus, so this guy is daisy chain to each one of the devices. If I'm getting rid of my communication bus, I use a coordinator on the MSTP bus, and I use my flags plugged into the controller. Okay, let's back up. Okay. Standalone. Standalone. Forget the one-to-one. -one. Standalone. You drop a flag in, you drop a transmitter out there, a sensor, we're good to go. Or not good to go. No, because you need the coordinator to form the mesh. Forget the forget. Oh, you. It, oh, yes. in other words, you have to, ah, yes. it has to. Uh, the yes. WRZ sets the pan. Yes, exactly. Like ah. the coordinator sets the pan. Oh, the coordinator sure. sets the pan, or the, the WRZ sets so the pan. You're right. So you're saying in a, in a standard, if they want to just do one, like if they want to do a retrofit job, you know, and just start start doing wireless on the projects, right? They'd have to take those that receiver out and then change it to a flag later if they're gonna go full blown. Yes, yes. If you're gonna go full blown you have to change that. You have to change that name. Bridge can you lock them? So I think we're good on the controllers, none of the wireless stuff. Any more questions? We'll take a break for like 10 minutes and we'll yeah, go into good. the assets. Uh, one quick note is that if you guys want to test out the wireless on any of your jobs, we have a test kit here you can borrow to use. Yeah. Yeah, correct. And it's kind of cool because you can take it home, you can put it in one end of your house, you can go all the way down to the basement and hit the button and see how the signal is. You know what I mean? 
It's kind of ridiculous. I've done it a lot. And it's, it's surprisingly strong. <laughs> 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 <laughs>